It's loading. Perfect. Okay. Oh, that's good. Super. Oh, the good old boy pointer type <laughs> is there. Oh, yeah, you remember that. I yeah. missed it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, you are so funny. <laughs> 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 okay, guys. So, uh, can I can I just start? Yeah, really go easy. ahead. Go ahead. And uh, then uh, I'll lead into to my team. Yeah, because I I want to keep this uh, very Perfect. short because uh, I mean uh, I'm just the project manager of Opsat. Uh, the guys who are doing the real work and the real creative stuff are gonna are gonna show you the, the stuff afterwards. Uh, but they just asked me first to just go over the concepts a little bit. So uh, that's Opsat there. Uh, we launched it in uh, the 18th of December uh, last year. So we're just coming up to our, uh, in five days, it'll be our one year in orbit. Uh, it's, uh, it's the first nanosat to be directly owned by ESA uh, and controlled by ESOC. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not a normal CubeSat. And uh, it's a lot of work being put into this. So it started in 2012, uh, and there's a lot of, uh, of money and investment in it. And uh, what, what the, it's basically two satellites. So it's a satellite within a satellite. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, this is at the bottom. This is the actual CubeSat itself. Uh, and then everything on top of this is the uh, peripherals, which are actually the experimental stuff. So this is a, I, I would say it's almost a GOM space satellite and the rest of it is uh, all the different things that, uh, that we're going to show you in a minute. And the idea behind launching a, a satellite was, I mean, the whole thing is trying to try and bring uh, some more innovation and uh, uh, accelerating the, 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 the rate that we actually get to experiment in flight. We normally, we can't experiment at all, uh, unless when things go wrong. Uh, so uh, with lots of constraints. So the idea was to try and uh, uh, allow experimentation in flight, which is what we're going to talk about soon, about how to be uh, an experiment and how to deploy open soft software, software on this and see how it reacts in orbit. So there is a full set of, uh, of, uh, of equipment there. We have uh, sensors, actuators, star tracker, magnetometers, uh, GPS, uh, reaction wheels, etc. So all that's there. Uh, there is open access to all the telemetry. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can get that via something called MUST. And uh, if you're an experimenter, you can just uh, log into MUST and see all the telemetry as it goes in, and we accept telemetry requests. Uh, there's also high speed communication, so we have X band uh, up to 50 megabits per second. I mean, we're not at 50 megabits per second yet, but we, we will get there. Uh, S band communication. We have a laser receiver on board, uh, a software defined radio as well on board, a receiver. So in UHF band, it's like a spectrum analyzer in space. And perhaps the most interesting thing here is we're flying an 800 megahertz processor with a reconfigurable FPGA. Uh, now, most command and control processors are not 800 megahertz. So this is a, you know, they're more like a 24 megahertz would be the standard ESA command and control processor. So this enables us to do things which uh, uh, you can't really do on the normal ESA space. So why, why is ESA? Uh, one thing, we, we already have many new things flying on the spacecraft embedded in the control. Uh, so we have many new uh, uh, pro communication protocols, which are, which are way ahead even of the missions that we're planning. Uh, things like the file transfer or different types of uh, command and control protocol or, or patents, new patents. Uh, we're trying these out, and we, we use these every day. The thing, uh, this, this is difficult, yeah, doing new stuff, uh, but we're using these every day. And so this is uh, uh, helping to smooth the path for the future for us. Uh, but on top of that, there's, a, there's another interesting thing, and I think that's where open source software comes in. Because we're flying that high power performance control processor, we can also, well, we do, we fly uh, normal software, shall we say, like terrestrial software, but that way, not embedded stuff, uh, Linux, uh, Java, Python. And uh, we actually use this to control the entire satellite because from this place where this high performance control processor is, you can basically do everything and perhaps even more than we can from the, uh, from the command and control processes. You can rotate the satellite, take pictures, uh, classify them, compress them, uh, communicate with the ground, et cetera, et cetera, over the internet. So uh, part of this, this whole uh, adventure is trying to see 
uh, how we can exploit all that processing power and, uh, and open soft, soft uh, software, et cetera, deploy it in space and see what a difference it makes to, uh, to how you would control stuff compared to the traditional way, which is embedded, traf uh, embedded software, very, very uh, classic control systems, uh, lots and lots of conservatism. And finally, uh, we also have this powerful FPGA. So it's a, a very powerful FPGA, Cyclone 5, uh, connected to that uh, processor. Uh, and uh, we believe this is going to com change command and control of spacecraft, just like onboard software did. When I started working in, in uh, command and control, it was basically lots of analog switches and relays. Uh, and already the deployment of onboard software, I mean, you guys can't remember this, but uh, it, it, it changed everything. It was a revolution, uh, being able to change things as the spacecraft uh, uh, mission went on. And we believe being able to change a firmware in space is also a revolution. And we're already seeing that. And some of the things we've done on OPSAT, there's no way in the world you could do this on a normal spacecraft. And it's incredibly powerful. So what do we offer on OPSAT? So as well as being uh, this for ESA, uh, we are off offering this also to, to the public. This is the first uh, public uh, satellite, shall we say, where the public are allowed to deploy their own software. So uh, and this is the point where the idea, the whole idea behind allowing the public, and by the public we mean everyone, but it I mean, uh, could be firms, could be firm, it could be uh, institutes, but it can also be uh, you know, individual people. Uh, and we do it at no extra cost. So there's no extra cost until, until uh, November 2021. Basically, you get to use this for free. Uh, no bureaucracy. You fill out a form. Uh, it takes two minutes. And from that moment on, you get access to the uh, platform. You can uh, you know, see the technical documentation and the actual uh, getting the software on board, especially if it's uh, following you know, standard practices, is really, really easy. You get to do stuff. Uh, and we, you get the results. And we don't ask for anything. We don't ask that you have a paper or fill out a, any form or tell us if you, even if it worked or not. This is the, the idea is that it's for you uh, and we are the facilitators of that. And we look after the risk of the spacecraft. So you don't have to worry about that. We're going we're gonna to look at, after the spacecraft itself and you can deploy your software. And this is, this is the, the, the idea. So we, we, you, the satellite can be reconfigured in many ways that are, are completely impossible. Like we can, we can bypass CCSDS protocols on the communication, for instance. Uh, you can change the firmware, as we just said, with the FPGA. Uh, you can reconfigure the entire uh, uh, the process. I mean, you can go down, you can just, in fact, it's even possible to get rid of Linux and start at uh, bare metal. So. Uh, and, and also for the first time, uh, you're also allowed to command and control the spacecraft over the internet. So we allow the ability, in fact, we did the first one on Friday, uh, an external experimenter to command and control uh, their experiment over the internet. I remember the, the, the experiment can be really powerful, like you know, uh, rotating the spacecraft and stuff like this. Uh, and of course, there's an OPSAC community, I'm sure the guys will talk about it later, where there's, we have lots of experiments already, we have 151. Uh, it's always increasing, and uh, and of course there's a community there where it's a good idea to synergize, exchange experiments can be built on top of each other. Now the story so far is because this is a uh, you know open soft software. The the first thing I have to say is uh, Satnox. So we thank you very much. So we start you know, although now the the mission is doing really really well in terms of you know we we have a X band and S band and megabytes of telemetry uh, going up and down. It wasn't like that at the start. Uh, we had a terrible time to start with. The first pass we took, we had no packets, no commanding. Uh, and uh, yeah, for several months, uh, we relied on, uh, on UHF uh, with a very bad link on our side and uh, a very bad, uh, big thank you to Satnox, which is an open source uh, uh, project. Because without us, I, I really think uh, we couldn't have run the mission. So yeah, thank you for saving our mission. Also Linux, uh, the, the power of Linux for me wasn't obvious until I saw uh, some of, well, all of my team basically using it in such powerful ways that I couldn't believe it. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I'm sure they'll go on about, but uh, the, the, I, I, I come from the old way of operating spacecraft and 
seeing them use this, uh, the power of Linux to make the thing efficient is, uh, is quite amazing. And Python, we have Python on board and managing the experiments is, is a completely different uh, uh, way of working with things, deploying py Python packages and doing some amazing things. Uh, TensorLite, so again, uh, I mean, George will we'll talk about this, but I think it's one of my key experiences in this whole lot is watching somebody go from uh, zero in, in a couple of days to actually deploy artificial intelligence on the satellite. And, and for it to be used uh, a couple of days after that operationally. So uh, the power of it is, is quite amazing. And finally, this could be only the beginning of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, open source software and space on OPSAT because, uh, and uh, yeah, we can, we're gonna take this further and further because I think it's the most promising route. And, uh, and just the thing, if anybody is looking for a challenge that would be instantly valuable to us on the mission, and of course, we would, uh, we would recognize uh, this because of that value. Here's one. So what, what we, uh, we have our problem is that uh, the ADCS controller, uh, we have magnet talkers as actuators and uh, have magnetometers, sun sensors, photodiodes as sensors. But we have up to now not been able to achieve NADIMO. So that means pointing uh, the spacecraft at the, the ground to be able to take uh, uh, be able to take photos and things, uh, etc. Uh, it's uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. So it sounds really easy, and of course we have things deployed in uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, terrestrial software, which works perfectly okay. But it doesn't work in space because uh, for any of you who have tried to to do this, it's a different environment with different problems. Uh, but if anybody wants to take that up as a as a project, then I would hundred uh, percent support them, and I would promise to deploy it uh, on the spacecraft operationally if it works. Okay, there you go. So this is my last slide, and just, uh, although this is not the best uh, picture from OPSAT, I do like it the most, and, and here you can see uh, the, the things that can be done. Uh, so this is a, a picture of Argentina, just uh, over Argentina, you can see, you can see some fires and the, the smoke rising up uh into space which uh yeah it could all lead to all sorts of possibilities for doing stuff and i terminate my presentation there a big thank you to my team who are going to present now they're the best uh best engineers i ever met so uh and it's all down to them so thank you very much and uh, i hope it all goes well from now bye thanks a lot dave this is amazing and, and thanks for highlighting uh, all the things you relied on and uh, and the team, of course. So next to speaker, I think it's Tom, and you're going to to go in more details. I make you presenter, Tom. All right. This closes your your screen sharing, Dave. I hope that's okay. Okay, George. I got your message. All right. Can you hear and see me? Yeah, I can hear, I see you. This is amazing. Great. Right. You're sharing your screen? Yes. Let's have a look. Share. All right. First try. Nice. Perfect. OK, the screen is yours. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave, for the introduction. So uh, I'll now be uh, more focusing on, on the actual details and how to get involved in OPSAT, what you can do. How you can do it, uh, all, all sort of stuff like that. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. Uh, wait, I have to click here. Okay. So, uh, I'll briefly show you our uh, experimental community and uh, how to get involved. Uh, Dave already briefly introduced what the, the payload is in OPSAP, but I'll go into a little bit more of the detail on, uh, on the specifications and what sort of uh, results you can get there, as well as how we test and upload your code. Um, but also how to communicate with your app in orbit, uh, since, uh, like Dave said, we had our first uh, last Friday, which was quite successful. I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about the operations um, and also highlight uh, amateur radio on OPSAT, uh, just a slide or two. And then uh, we will go to some live demonstrations. Um, we have quite some things to show you, so hopefully it all goes well. 
We did have some issue with the fact that for our demos, we needed the ESA VPN, and for some reason, we can't join the conference uh, when we're on the VPN. But So you might see some of us which are uh, dual joined with some accounts. So hopefully that all goes well. So let, let's see. We'll do our best. And maybe if, if, if it even goes well with the time, we will have a live uh, past demonstration with the spacecraft. All right. Uh, I'm just going to... I'm also logged in here with uh, two computers. Okay, so about, about our experimenter, so as Dave already said, so we have a very uh, wide range. So we have startups, universities, uh, even individual research groups, but even large corporations. So you see, for example, Airbus, Kness, we have a very, it varies greatly, and, and so, so, do, so do the, the subjects of the experiments themselves. Um, up till now, we've had 153 uh, registrations, and the main interaction uh, happens through our community platform. So let me just uh, drop the link there. Um, as you can see there from the distribution, it, it varies a, a lot. So a lot of the applications are on board with respect to image compression, uh, housekeeping, telemetry. We also have some experiments using the software defined radio, like you can see uh, some ADCS uh, monitoring, uh, a lot of scheduling and autonomy. So this is something that's actively worked on as well as inside, inside ESOC itself um, for more and more smart uh, um, scheduling, so to say. Um, like I said, so our community platform is like the, the, the central, uh, the, the, the core of the OPSAT mission. I've just pasted the, the link in the, in the chat there. So uh, what, we, what, what we're using it for, so first of all, like Dave said, we, you can get uh, every spacecraft telemetry parameter that there is in near real time and also export those parameters, look at command history, um, so that's that, that's that's one thing that this portal provides access to, but also most importantly, live connections. So when we test your when we test your your code, or you want want to, to check your your application, you can also connect to our uh, to our testing infrastructure, which are a couple of flat sets, which I'll talk about in a minute. But also even connect to the to our mission control system and send and receive your data over over the the ground station link. So this is uh, something that's very powerful. But also software submission, so all the, the code you write, uh, you can submit. There's an automated packaging pipeline, which we'll also talk about in a minute, which um, basically packages your code and does checks on it to make sure that it's safe. And then we can deploy it on our flat sets. And if everyone's happy, we can deploy it in orbit and go from there. Also data dissemination. So if your experiment generates log files, images, um, IQ files, uh, radio recordings, uh, you, you name it. Um, you generate it on board the spacecraft, and we, we synchronize it with, with, uh, with, with, the, with the platform there. And you can get your data via SFTP um, all in a near real time fashion. And also, our experimental support so we, there's a lot of hardware, software documentation, uh, news updates, forum, bug report, issue tracking, all the usual um, ecosystem that you need to, to, to manage a, a, a project that's uh, complex as this one. So, just a brief overview I've placed the link, have a look. Uh, if you want to uh, get involved, there's instructions on the homepage. So just shoot an email to Dave uh, and, uh, and me as well if you want to get involved. And that's the usual standard procedure. So more about the possibilities on OPSAT. So like Dave, uh, you already showed you a nice image. Um, more specifically, we have a resolution about 70 meters per pixel. Of course, a color camera with variable exposure range um, uh, with a resolution of, of uh, 2048 by 1944 pixels. So some more images there, just for, re for just for reference, uh, what you can do. We also have an advanced ADCS. Um, this is not this, this is not the ADCS that Dave mentioned we have problems with. This is sort of a, another standalone unit which we give, which we allow the experimenters to have full control over, uh, which also has a star tracker and reaction wheel. So this one does have the option that it can do quite precise uh, or um, attitude determination. Um, also, since it's a, a Cyclone 5 system on chip, there's also an FPGA section on the chip, which we allow our, uh, the experimenters to, to, to run, to, to, um, to synthesize your, your hardware on, IP cores, uh, you name it, uh, new, new telemetry framers, the framers, it, get, it can yeah, basically be anything. Um, also have an optical receiver on board, so the, uplate, the uplink rate here is rather limited, so it's not, it's this, the function of this optical receiver is not for super high gigabit uh, uh, data transfer rates, but it's merely um, to, to transfer either an encrypted key or, 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 um, or, or other data sort of at a, a, lower, a lower rate, but still, still at, in a reliable fashion. Um, also, uh, we have a software-defined radio, the uh, 
uh, LMS 6002D from like microsystems, which in theory the front end does cover 300 megahertz and 3.8 gigahertz, but on upside it's connected to a monopole antenna. So I would expect still decent results between 300 and 800 megahertz. So that's sort of like the, the active uh, receiving range that we're looking at. Also an X-band transmitter, which we can directly interface to the FPGA, so through, uh, through LVDS, uh, LVDS lines to either implement custom um, high-rate high file downlink or, or similar experiments. Uh, I finally, but uh, last but not least, is the, the, the core of OPSAT itself. It, we call it the SEP. It's the Satellite Experimental Processing Platform. It's basically two uh, Altera Cyclone 5 system on chip uh, where we run uh, on the ARM core embedded Linux uh, with Python available, Java, C, C++, uh, yeah. Anything you 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 would you could run on ground you you could run there, so also some some uh, examples there. That's what the that's what the oh, okay, it works. That's what it looks like. Uh, also, this was this below this bottom spectrogram here is when we uh, recorded uh, a UHF carry that was uplinked uh, and recorded basically on, on the spacecraft and then downloaded it as a IQ file. And I believe this was also this was um, analyzed using InSpectrum, uh, which maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, it's also on GitHub, so that's it's quite uh, quite interesting there to see um, to see that working. So how we test and upload your code? So software on Opsat is managed uh, by OPKG. So any any files or executables that we upload are always in the IPK package package format. This makes it easy for us to essentially um, keep track of the files so that we can just do uh, issue, install, a remove, and update. It's it's very it's very simple from. We have two test beds available. So one is our FlatSat, which is a smaller uh, version of the spacecraft, which only has the onboard computer and a couple of pow um, power distribution units. However, we also have a fully fledged engineering model, which you can see uh, see here, which has almost everything the spacecraft has except the solar arrays, um, the radio, uh, a couple of radio modems, uh, and also, I believe, what else doesn't it have? Yeah, of course, yeah, the S-band antennas, and so it's it's sort of a it, it, it's mo most of the things you would need to to verify most of the experiments we we come across. We often test online, uh, so with experimenters in the loop. So I'll, I'll I'll talk to it about the next slides. So they make a live connection, and this this is transparent for them. So it would be as if they were connected to the real satellite. So this makes it easy on the experimenter side to basically prepare ground applications and and uh, stuff like that. So there's usually several iteration cycles until we're happy with the performance, we simulate some orbital scenarios and, and go from there. So that's sort of like the inf uh, testing infrastructure um, that, we're, that we're looking at. Um, so how to communicate with your app in orbit? Um, so there are several ways, essentially four. So one is via, so you can see here that's, that's ground, that's space. You can do it via file, so file-based operations, either it's a scheduled file or a file uh, describe uh, which has some timestamps. It can be anything you want. You can define it yourself. And those are synchronized in a semi near real time fashion with your application on board. So there's a path convention. Um, and uh, yeah, that's you can get your own files uh, on board uh, the spacecraft. A lot of our experiments also use space packets. So if you know the CCSDS space packet protocol, it's, it's a way to directly talk to up to your application OPSAT because we route the, the packet on the canvas and you can receive it on your application on board. I'll, I'll show it in a second in, a, in more detail. We also, you can also um, run a command shell to the satellite. So this is quite unique. So you can just, on the, on the lower level, it just uses, uh, again, uh, again uh, the space packet protocol, but the payload itself contains, contains uh, the, the Linux commands. And finally, last but not least, uh, we have also an MO, serv an MO services pilot um, deployment. It's sort of like a higher level um, uh, topology on top of the usual packet utilization standard where, where it's sort of like a higher level. You can launch actions, you can monitor telemetry. Um, it will, uh, Dominique and, and uh, Lorenzo will, will, will um, address all about that. So I'm just gonna quickly go over these points. So like I said, um, how to get files uh, up to the satellite. We use again SFTP with our uh, community platform as a front end. You can transfer files uh, in, in your, um, every experimenter has a home folder, you transfer files, and then whenever they're synchronized with your uh, application on board, you will get a report, and then you can, you can go from there. Um, we also use CFDP, so this is the CCSDS file delivery protocol, which is the, also the first in orbit used by ESA, so it's also something, something interesting. 
uh, there. Um, if you generate any images, log files, you dump them in your, your own home folder, a two-ground folder, and they get synchronized whenever we have uh, acquisition of signal with, with the satellite, essentially. And then you can just pull them using SFTP. So from an experimental point of view, there's also a lot of room for automation since you can just use, use uh, your, own, uh, um, your own tools, so to speak. Using space packets, like I said, uh, this is usually done via port forwarding. So you port forward again into our community platform, which is like our front end server, um, where you can then send and receive space packets. You have to adhere to your APID because this is uh, important because it, this APID is used to route basically your packets on, onto the uh, payload on our computer on, on the spacecraft. And then all you have to do on board is connect your application to a TCP server, which sort of you know, broadcasts all the, the frames. And then you just filter for your own uh, telecommands and telemetry. So it's a very, it's a very interesting way of, uh, of, of provisioning, provisioning the link to, to, to OPSAT. Uh, like I said, command shell. So it's like uh, you have your own user on the stack when we install, install your experiment. Um, and you can run any, any Linux command that you wish under your own non root user, of course, um, which is also a first for ESA. So this is sort of what it looks like. We have a um, component on ground which multiplexes uh, all the telecommands. And when, we, when, we, when you send telecommand, it gets, uh, according to the APID, it knows that it's a uh, spatial command. So it formats it, uplinks it to the satellite, and you directly receive standard out on your end. So you can run anything from a shell script to, um, to, to just Linux commands, so basically anything, uh, or, or launch your application via that, you, you, can, you can choose. You're very free in that, in that respect. Um, of course, limited to your own uh, non-root user. And, also, and finally, the ML services. So this is also quite interesting uh, approach since you can essentially control your application via a web browser. Um, what, that, what that means is you can launch actions. So you, it's like a normal telecommand stack, so you can define actions. Uh, you can launch them, you can monitor telemetry uh, uh, aggregations in this case, and basically control your app uh, from a browser, which is, which is even more uh, interesting. So like Dave said, over the internet. Um, about operations, we use the Smile app um, of ESOC. So we're the main user of this uh, infrastructure. So Smile stands for a Special Mission Infrastructure Laboratory Environment. Uh, we also heavily use automation because the OPSAT passes uh, due to the uh, um, sun synchronous orbit that we're in, there's usually two passes before six, six o'clock in the morning and then the evening passes after six o'clock in the, uh, after 6 p.m. So it's, there, there's never an overlap with working hours really. So we usually uh, automate everything and pre-program activities and, and monitor the system. So uh, of course, most of the commissioning in the last months has been done remotely due to um, COVID constraints. That was also quite interesting. Uh, experience, but now we're quite used to it and have adapted quite well to it. Um, also operates on three frequency bands. We have uh, the 3.7 meter uh, as X-band uh, tracking antenna for our nominal uh, file operations, high-speed uh, telemetry telecommand. And we also have UHF, uh, which we also um, use from time to time. The download usually we keep active uh, to uh, increase our coverage also, again, via SATMOX, which I get to now. So amateur radio and OPSAT. So in the beginning, before launch, we published the downlink specification. So the, the formatting, how, how to decode it, because OPSAT uses UHF amateur radio frequency. So uh, also uh, in collaboration with uh, Chris Bridges, I think he's still in the loop, yes. So uh, thanks also Chris there. So it was quite a, an interesting experience. Uh, we saw a lot of activity. So there were, we, there were the outreach was quite, uh, quite amazing. So there was a lot of signal reports uh, at the, uh, during the LEOP also including the first beacon reports, uh, also via SATNOX and also individual signal reports. This was, this was amazing to see. We also presented the GNU uh, radio conference. Um, let me just quickly uh, provide you the links there. So that's from our GitHub page. And then uh, there was this publication, which should have the um, presentation as well as the paper. Okay. Um, yeah, so via SATNOX, I think the numbers are already uh, out of date, but there were already more than 600,000, 30,000 uh, UHF packets received, uh, and in total, 13,500 passes with OPSAT, so that's, that's quite, quite some amazing numbers there. Um, and we also do have more UHF uh, activities uh, planned in the future uh, with respect to the UHF downlink, where we might look into image dissemination 
or, uh, or other uh, interesting activities sort of transmit uh, encoded text or we, we, we still have to uh, figure it out. But if anyone has any ideas, then feel free to reach out and we'll see what we can do. But there's definitely uh, possibilities there. Uh, yeah, here again, you can see sort of the wide uh, variety of, uh, of activities that we had during the LEOP. So we had the FH Aachen tracking us uh, via SATNOX. There was, there was also the Dwingelo uh, radio telescope. Uh, which I believe also was one of the first to, to uh, decode one of the beacons and only a two degree elevation pass, but of course that's, uh, that doesn't surprise you as a, if, if you have a, such an installation. Um, and of course, uh, on, on Twitter, lots of activity with people using uh, GR OPSA to uh, decode the first beacon. So um, that was very interesting. So ESA wasn't, the, so we weren't the first to make contact. So we, we saw already before we made contact that the spacecraft was healthy. Uh, and that beacons were being transmitted, uh, indicating the antennas had deployed. So this was this was uh, very valuable. So again, uh, excellent job there. And now uh, I will leave it to Dominique, Lorenzo, and George to slowly start moving to the demo. Um, so like I said, we had some technical difficulties, but let's see uh, what we can do. So with that, I would say uh, thanks, and let's now move on to the more uh, practical session. So I see that Dominique said, I think George is ready to roll. So let's see how that goes. Yes, thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank you. Uh, George, I give you presenter rights. You can, uh, you can uh, go on. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. You were muted, right? That's okay. <laughs> okay. Good. So you're the presenter. You can share your screen. It's in the middle, bottom, bottom, middle. Perfect. Yep. Got it. Okay. Great. So. Nice. Uh, see. Get started. So, I believe we only have about thirty minutes until the pass. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. Um, so I'm gonna try and do this. Uh, a bit quick so that we can have some time for Dominic to do his presentation as well. Okay, so uh, Dave gave me a very nice introduction on uh, how we ran AI on board the spacecraft. And I'll provide some specifics in terms of how we used open source technology to achieve this, notably with TensorFlow Lite, and how the use of open source technology and already all these available resources uh, that we can run off the box allowed us to run this and get started in, in about a week's worth of work. Uh, most of the work for this was actually spent uh, watching YouTube videos on how to train a model. I was a complete beginner in uh, machine learning. So it really shows you the flexibility and the power of the platform of allowing someone who's completely new in the field uh, deploy and launch something that's become an operational uh, tool for day-to-day -to -day use in a satellite. So let's get started. Just a bit of background on what the problem was. So we have some challenges with our attitude control. Um, and as Dave mentioned, we don't always get Nadir pointing. Uh, so when we took images, when we were acquiring images, we were getting a lot of bad images. So either they were pointing out into space, either they were too blurry. Uh, or either they just weren't interesting at all. For instance, overexposed. Uh, so while we're trying to figure out the, the solution to our Nadir pointing issues, what we could at least do is filter out the bad images that we get. And I thought that this is really classic machine learning 101 case study of feeding a uh, Feeding an algorithm, a training algorithm, a set of bad images, a set of good images, producing a model and running it on board. So this is exactly what we did. Uh, we used TensorFlow Lite the, uh, to train a model, and we compiled a inference uh, program using the TensorFlow Lite C API, uh, which runs really nicely on board the spacecraft, and then. The application itself to acquire an image and to execute the the uh, 
classification, image classification program is a Python app. That's it. So now we're only downlinking images of value, meaning that are labeled as the deer ish earth images, or if we want edge images of the, the earth limb, they're quite nice. And the app was also designed to have uh, designed with reusability in mind. Um, we'd really like to have to see other experimenters uh, use the image classification program. It's it's designed in a way that it's it can run any model uh, that is of TensorFlow Lite uh, format, so a TF Lite model file, and you can configure the size of the image input uh, that you want to feed it. So, for instance, I used uh, uh, I used transfer learning, so I was I was constrained to a specific input size of the images, uh, but that's configurable and we can input any image size. Uh, the app itself supports a pipeline, the upcoming version at least, where we can chain different models. So if you have a model that produces an output, you can feed that output into another model uh, and get another output from that. And the idea is that we want to be able to build a chain of models and start crowdsourcing best models from here and there uh, into some processing pipeline. And the reason why I had really wanted push to use something like TensorFlow Lite is I really wanted to attract uh, people who operate in this field with these popular frameworks to give them an opportunity to run models in in space, in the space segment, even though they don't operate in the space sector. So here's a bit of an example of what I mean by, by chaining models. Uh, we get an image, we classify it as either good, bad, or an Earth image. And if it's an Earth image, why not apply another model and classify it as either a cloudy or not cloudy image? A very basic example, but you can see the flexibility and the power of, of chaining these models and crowdsourcing these models. Uh, again, the idea is grab everything we already have from the uh, artificial intelligence community and replace this whole deployment stack with uh, OPSAT, giving OPSAT some certain accessibility to all of the talent that's already been developed in, uh, in the AI sector, particularly in the open source community. Moving forward, uh, we wanna start building ML chains in our image classification pipeline on board. And we wanna, I mean, resource permitting, and if we can get some help, see if we can get other inference models, other inference frameworks running on the satellite. It'd be great to get something like PyTorch or CAFE running on board and not just TensorFlow Lite. So that would be a really great project for any experimenter interested in running machine learning algorithm space to get into. So I can run a quick model uh, on the flat set, or I can stop now and leave Dominic some time to do his presentation uh, so that we have enough time for the uh, for the pass. Uh, I would say the latter, because in the demo, you'll just see this terminal command of acquiring an image and successfully uh, classifying it, which is not that very exciting, to be honest, but to see, but it's exciting per se, but visually, not so much. But yeah, that's it. Um, unless you guys really want to see it running on the flat set, uh, then I would say let's move on to Dominic. All right, so if you guys if you guys want the demo, then I have to switch users, uh, meaning we'd have to switch presentation rights, rights from George Prez to George Ops. OK, I'm switching the presenter uh, now. Yeah. George. Uh, Jobs. Okay. And so, please, please keep in mind that we're assuming that we can share a screen over VPN. It might not work. Let's see. Let's see where it goes. Okay. Let's see. So George Jobs now is the presenter. No. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Uh, you can see my my up screen, right? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, All right. Great. OS MCF. Yep. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, so let's not disconnect my other user because I'm relying on it for audio. <laughs> we uh, know. We won't. All right. So uh, this is uh, where. So we're in the. Um, we're in the uh, Linux distribution uh, 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 payload uh, processor, which is on ARM9. So this is why we're able to run uh, cool stuff like uh, Java, Python, and C, and whatnot. And this is why we're able to run uh, uh, TensorFlow Lite on board as well. So this is the processor that's a payload uh, that gives us the processing power to do so. So I'm in my experiment folder here. And essentially, I just have this Python script uh, that, will, that will trigger an image acquisition and then put the image, resize the image as an input image for the image classification program, and then feed it into the image classification program, which uses TensorFlow Lite. So I'm just going to run it. Uh, I've disabled the image acquisition because this is the flat set. Uh, and this is the small flat set, and there's no camera on board. But I've prepared an Earth image here, uh, which it should classify correctly as an Earth image. Uh, so let's see, Python 3, fire, there we go. So here we acquired an image. It's resizing it uh, using these image processing libraries. Uh, it ran the. Uh, image classification program, which again is a C program with TensorFlow Lite C API. These are the results of the prediction. So it's 90% certain that it's an Earth picture. It labeled the image as an Earth. And in our configuration file, we said, you know what? Keep images that are labeled as Earth. So it's keeping it. We told it not to keep the raw images. So its raw image file format doesn't exist. And then it's moving it to our two ground folder. And then if I move to our two ground folder and do a list, I can see I have an Earth directory that was created. And when I look at my Earth directory, I got my Earth PNG that was acquired there. So imagine this app running on a loop as we're acquiring several images, one every five seconds or so. Every time we apply the classification program and it sorts it in a subdirectories, whether it's Earth, Bad, or Edge. And if we don't want to keep the bad images, it doesn't even bother sorting those. It just disregards them. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, it'd be interesting if people can figure out a model that runs faster or a model that does more classification, like within Earth images. Maybe we want to see uh, novelty detection or, or cloud detection or, or land versus sea or whatnot. Very nice, uh, George. Uh... Do, is your code uh, available, or? Uh, it is. Um, I can share the link in the chat. Great, great. OK, what do you need next? Uh, do you need somebody else to present, or you you will? Uh... So somebody else, it's, it should be somebody else's turn. I think it's. Um... Dominic, maybe sending you a message. Maybe. <laughs> Dominic, you can take it. I uh, will close your presentation and make him presenter, if you don't mind. All right. Go ahead. All right, Dominic. We are back to this very creative page. Stand by. He's doing audio check. All right. Now, this is a really nice application, uh, George, by the way. Thanks for the link. Okay, Dominique, we see your screen.
Uh, thanks, Pradita. I was uh, I was saying that we can't hear <laughs> Dominic while I was muted. Uh, George, maybe while uh, Dominic is uh, is uh, no funny. Okay. okay. I think you should be able to hear me now. Yes, yes. Okay, sorry for the delay. Yeah, I forgot I have to connect with microphone. Uh, all right, then. So, hello. Uh, I would like you uh, to introduce you um, uh, to, to Experimental Framework. This is this uh, highest level uh, application framework that we make available on, on board of Opsat uh, that Tom mentioned before. Um, so yeah, let's let's get to it. Oh yeah, I should be able to also do this, maybe with some luck. Okay, hello. Um, so uh, just few points I want to go over. Uh, so system overview: what is NanoSatemo framework? Uh, what do we provide as a uh, as software development kit? Um, what do we provide as auxiliary tools? And then we switch over quickly to two demos. First, I'll demonstrate really quickly uh, what can you do with uh, with what we provide. Uh, and then I will hand it off, uh, over to Lorenzo, uh, who's, uh, who will demonstrate a, a high level end-to-end -end, uh, application supposed to uh, perform camera acquisitions in an organized manner. Okay, so system overview. Um, this is upset. Uh, similar diagram to what Tom already has presented, just uh, different, um, differently organized. Um, all of the gray boxes are hardware. Um, here are the two buses: CAN bus, SpaceWire. Recently, we started using SpaceWire. Um, still working that one out. And here is our main two main pieces of software, uh, NanoSat MO framework with libraries, supervisor, and applications that you can build, uh, and payload drivers, which is just a set of uh, hardware drivers that uh, NMF talks to. So uh, what NMF is, is really, um, it, it's a framework allowing you to build applications without having to worry too much with uh, interacting with the hardware, what driver do I load? What command do I send? Uh, or I want to, I want to uh, have a telecommand or parameter available to the ground. How do I do that? Uh, NMF makes it uh, makes it possible with just uh, a few lines of code. Uh, then on a ground segment. Uh, uh, after the space link, we have uh, data proxy. This is something you might hear about, but you won't see it yourself. This is internal part of our mission control system. It routes data across different uh, paths. Um, and then we have another NMF element, which is called grant MO proxy uh, for experiments. Uh, this one, um, ensures that any kind of services, it's a service-oriented architecture, by the way, any kind of services exposed on board, like uh, telecommanding, so action service or parameter service, are available to the application on the uh, on the ground, because the, the applications that, uh, are made in a, in a manner that's not necessarily um, aware, fully aware of the link. They shouldn't be necessarily aware of the link presence or not. Uh, so whenever you need you need your service to be present all the time, like uh, your parameters or your, your telecommands history, you make something that's called proxy. Um, and then this is where you are, the experimenter. Uh, so you can interact with with this uh, with this software stack in in different manners. So first, you can just use a web browser and use the top level interface that we provide, which is lightweight web based MCS. Uh, you could uh, skip that. You could make a custom MO uh, mission operation services and or NMF based grant application, which uh, still uses this proxying facility. Uh, or you can say, okay, I don't care about any of that. I just create my own grant application which may or may not be MO based, uh, may or may not speak NMF, uh, um, uh, uh, NMF under understandable interfaces, uh, you could just connect directly here and send space uh, space packets via a dedicated uh, TCP port. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Uh, so what do we provide? We provide monitoring control. There is a payload 
abstraction layer, which is really hardware abstraction layer. So instead of uh, having to having to do something with IMS 100 image sensor, you just use camera service. You say take picture. Um, NMF supervisors applications uh, for a management component because NMF supervisor. We use this one extensively in operations. It's uh, it's our central point, which starts and stops all the all the applications, whether they may be NMF applications or not. Um, there are some basic uh, signals that it handles for the platform. So. Um, the uh, OPSAT, OPSAT payload processing platform uh, needs to do a few things like uh, send the heartbeat to, to our onboard computer. A supervisor takes care of that for you. Um, <clears throat> we do perform the space to ground replication via ground MO proxy. Um, there, is a, there is a whole uh, concept of data model, which is called COM archive. Uh, it stores all the telecommands history on the telemetry history and the definitions. This is uh, replicated across space to ground. Uh, it's a little bit problematic component, but we'll figure it out, uh, figure it out right now. Um, and uh, this, this replication provides us offline mirroring of the data on the ground. Now, the space application stack looks like this. We have uh, satellite platform at the bottom and satellite pass. Uh, so all the you can see all the payloads here, all the interfaces that uh, that we we use. Um, so there is our there is our NMF MNMF layers, which is payload abstraction layer. Uh, this those uh, there is extra extra. Um, abstraction within NMF, which is called adapters. So uh, in theory. Uh, and in practice, those, this abstraction layer is, pale, uh, is platform agnostic, which means that uh, we can run it on OPSAT, but we can also run it on um, any mission. In this case, it's either OPSAT or a simulation mission that you can run uh, on, your, on your own computer. Thank you, Red. Um, so we also have MNC services implementation with an NMF core. Um, and there's those generic composites that you can in infer, and there's application, which is your code. Um, service APIs, uh, they are available, okay, right now they are on my GitHub, uh, but you can preview them all in a, in a web browser uh, and see what APIs we, we expose via MO services. Uh, now, what do we provide in simulators? We simulate uh, core OPSAT payloads, GPS, IADCS, and camera. We allow executing simulation scenarios, uh, time control, visualization, interface, Celestia. Okay, this is work in progress. Any help on that would be very helpful, very appreciated. Um, portable implementation, which means that uh, it works cross-platform really uh, on Windows, Linux. It's Java-based. Uh, we also support recent, since uh, some time ago, hybrid mode, which means that we can run simulator actually on board of our, of our satellite or on board of our engineering model and payload some of the service uh, and uh, simulate some of the uh, platforms, uh, services like um, GPS or navigation. Uh, because of course, when you are in a stationary satellite, the, the GPS, uh, it's not moving. So it's not that useful. Um, okay. Thank you, Juan. Uh, there is consumer test tool that you can use. So that it's sort of a lower level tool that uh, you can use quickly to test uh, your application, also to interact with supervisor, which operationally you cannot, um, you cannot do. Um, and there's this live emission control system, um, which is really a web interface that we host. We also provide it to you as Docker. Um, so while at all of the NMF, or I would say 99% is open source. Uh, lightweight emission control system, unfortunately, is not, although it is freely available to all the uh, all the experimenters who send me an email, that, well, read a license and say, I accept it. Uh, and then you get the binaries, uh, a set of Docker images. Um, yep, yeah, you can, uh, I, I should be able to demonstrate it in a second. Um, okay, so NMF in a production-like connectivity uh, is uh, uh, th this is this is how it works. This is how it works in a, on an actual satellite. This here uh, is broken by a space link, of course. Uh, 
and you can also replicate it on your own uh, computer. It's just a little bit, bit more work. Uh, normally, you can just bypass this this component altogether, connect directly to your NMF application, uh, because of course this proxy is supposed to be transparent. Um, so demos. Um, I'll just very quickly run over my demo. Uh, do you guys mind if we actually run a little bit over if there is the, if Tom wants to demonstrate the pass, then I say, I do a quick demo, uh, then we jump to the pass, and then I would say, uh, close to the end of the pass, maybe uh, Lorenzo can jump in with the second demo of, of NMF. Why not? Yeah, it's good. So if we can catch the pass, it's nice. Okay. Less, less than seven minutes now. Okay. So, um, just jumping quickly to the NMF code. Uh, this is what I have uh, in, in NetBeans right now. Um, so what I can demonstrate to you is starting supervisor uh, and uh, perhaps showing some basic interaction with it. Uh, debug mode is not necessary. I just discovered some uh, compatibility bug with uh, Windows, so I won't be able to start an application, I believe, but we'll manage. Um, so this is the supervisor that just started. Um, there's this tool that I uh, mentioned, which is consumer test tool. Um, you can use it yourself. It's uh, part of NMF. Uh, it's part of NMF SDK. And uh, you can actually display quite a bit of information about the supervisor already and or any application that you connect to. Um, yeah, but what I wanted to show is actually this higher level tool. Uh, let's see if this works out. So you get it as a set of... Uh, uh, Docker images. Uh, this is all described on this this website. Um, if you follow the news about lightweight MCS and you accept it, you get access to this. You download Docker image, you spawn the Docker image, and then you should be able to use this. Uh, so let's see if I made enough of sacrifices to the demo gods. Fetch the provider, connect. So since I wasn't able to quickly start application for uh, for this demo because of this compatibility bug that I mentioned, I just extended NMF supervisor quickly uh, via, normally it's not supposed to, to be processing any telemetry or, or um, any platform telemetry, it's just a bridge uh, for applications to do this, but there's nothing stopping supervisor from acting as an application itself. So what I did is uh, in this, basic adapter of supervisor, I added a few things like attitude quaternion uh, here. I added some commands like uh, sun pointing, naked pointing, unset attitude. And to expose them on the space to ground monitoring control interface, I, I had to annotate them with this Java annotation. So it's a parameter here. Uh, and here it's an action. Um, now I connect to, I already connected to the supervisor, I can go to parameter browser and those uh, Java variables I just created um, are indeed available here. I should be able to show it on a graphical display and you can see, uh, never mind the error messages, that it's being plotted in real time. Um, what we can also do is go to manual stack, uh, quickly attempt at least to switch it to sun pointing, maybe then make a stack to unset attitude, um, and perhaps switch it to nadir pointing for, uh, let's say, zero hours, one minute, zero seconds. Apply, arm and go. Let's see if we see any change on there might not be obvious or maybe let's see <laughs> not sure if we have time for that but I guess if I now answer the attitude and perhaps switch to nadir pointing mm -hmm. um, I don't know how long you need to switch to Tom but your, your three minutes uh, yeah, yeah minutes thank you to impact <laughs> yeah perfect we'll switch over shortly this is the last point of my 
presentation. Oh yeah, so here's the manual stack. Uh, you can see the action history. So all of them, they were successfully released, accepted and completed on board. Um, in this case by supervisor, in your case that would be by your application. Uh, well, we don't see much of uh, attitude change. There is there is actually non-discrete slew implemented in the si simulator, so I don't expect it to to be immediately visible. Um, okay, this concludes my part of presentation. I suggest we quickly switch over to Tom for a pass. Very nice. Uh, and then back to Lorenzo to to demonstrate the camera application. Very good, Tom. This is to you. Okay, can you hear me? Oh wait, I'm having some feedback. We can hear you. We we hear the feedback a bit. Okay. Let's mute this one. It's better now, anyway. Okay. Tom, I'm I'm gonna use this to communicate with you as well. Okay. Uh, I think you can all see my screen now, right? Yes. Okay, so we're just waiting for our antenna to start tracking. So this is azimuth and elevation. So we're at one degree now. So this is for our S-band antenna, and then for UHF, we have our connections here. Okay, so we're connected uh, via tunnel to our UHF ground station in Austria, so no data yet. So let's switch over to prime chain. So this is this, um, this data proxy which Dominic was referring to. So we're connected to our cortex, which is our ground station. We're connected up to the MCS. Okay, all looks good. Um, this is our automation system, so all procedures are essentially loaded as uh, XML files and there were already all the telecommands sent, so we're now waiting for a response for the spacecraft to do the time tech queue check to basically resend uh, the schedule. So we're just waiting for AOS now, so let's see. Your elevation is at three degrees. Okay, so we see a weak signal on the downlink, okay. Stand by for telemetry, and we have telemetry, so there's idle frames. Let's just filter for a bit and now to see some housekeeping data. Okay. The carrier is enabled. Okay, yeah. So we're getting data here, so we're seeing anything from pseudo beacons to fault detection, isolation, and recovery uh, to down to quaternion. So let's just check here. Our onboard software mode is operational, uh, everything looks okay. We just saw uh, a response to a watchdog reset, I think. Let's switch over back to Matis. We're basically now waiting for our onboard receiver to get a lock. So you'll see here this green TM flow. So we have to S band telemetry coming down, but we don't yet have a lock on the onboard receiver. So there's no uh, telecommands yet uh, that are arriving, so we have to wait for the signal strength to increase, and we should uh, have uh, a bit locked shortly. So signal is down. Tom, you have a you have an IPK in the IPK folder, also yeah. a last chunk of a PNG that's set to downlink. Okay, so we should see that. Okay. Now, now it's just a waiting game. <laughs> So we're at 11 degrees elevation. Okay. And Tom, I'll wait on your call to send the spatial command for the PNG split for the next image. Yeah, okay, okay, stand by please. Yeah, we just have to wait for the onboard receiver to get a lock now, so it's waiting game. Okay, signal strength is increasing. We should soon see TC link go green if everything's okay. We're getting quite some CRC errors on the downlink, but that's okay since those are filtered out. So let's just wait a little bit now. Tom, can you have client four on the side? Yes, stand by. In case there's time to run the spatial, it might be interesting to watch. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, just, okay, I see. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just keep that ready. Um, I'm just waiting, I'm still waiting for the signal strength to go up. Just keep it here. Okay, 
increasing, so we should soon have onboard lock. Tom, that's lock. It just says it wrong. You can go with it. All right, yeah, we have one TCV. So now there should be schedule being reset. Okay, and we're receiving responses from the spacecraft. Okay, good. So the, all these tests here, that's basically activity tracking. So, for example, this first A here, it means it's accepted on the spacecraft. Uh, the C means that it's completed. So we can basically track the, the execution status of a telecommand all the way from, from uh, releasing the telecommand to acceptance on the spacecraft to execution on the spacecraft and trace this all the way back down to see if everything uh, completed fine. Um, so we have uh, yeah, one more command to send and I think we're all fine. Okay, so as you can see, I, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just looking how everything uh, is doing and we're already downloading some files. So we can should see here on MCA, the CFDP frames being received. Yes, and we're seeing them. Okay, so it's basically now, I believe George Sinem is coming down, right? It's Exactly, it's the last chunk of a PNGH. Okay, okay, I see. So let's switch over to Matt A. Okay, yeah. and here we see uh, onboard uh, telemetry, which was compressed and stored being downloaded now. Like Dominic said, we're now also working working on uh, on spaceware, which should now allow us to fully saturate our one one megabit uh, downlink rate. So we're now not quite at that stage yet. We still need to integrate uh, operationally, but we should then also be able to use XBand and go to six megabits uh, effective file transfer rate. So this would be very interesting to see. Uh, Tom, this is right. what, what do we see right now? Those are the locks of your spacecraft. Yes. Th so this is this is a lock from the automation system. It's basically it's reporting the completion of a file download. So you can see here from the ground station, we're, we're receiving all these packets here with a certain APIT. So this is APIT 124. And you see here that this daemon reports a connection here. So it's being routed to an application which sort of assembles this file. So if you look at this file, it's just, just binary chunks of the, of, the, of the image file, either compressed or uncompressed. It really depends. So um, actually, we could, we could have a look at what's on board. Should maybe still be in the lock, but let's check. complicated enough doing this live, so let alone over. Okay, there we go. Um, so those are all the files on board. So we basically dump the directory listing with all the checksums, the file path, and then the size. So that, that's the response basically from, from the spacecraft. And then we iterate over those files and we trigger a downlink for each one of them individually. So that's what you're seeing here. So we have, I think we're almost- We have about one minute left. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's no bit lock anymore. We lost the PC link, okay. Yeah, we lost it, okay. So just for your information on a technical level, the way it works is we get a stream of idle frames all the time from the S-band transceiver. Um, and uh, at the end of each frame, there is so-called CLCW, uh, con uh, commanding link control world, I think it's. Um, and in that CLCW, you actually get a feedback from the from the transceiver uh, whether we get a, we get a um, RF lock and then a bit lock and a frame lock. I can bring up okay, the thank you, Ian. It's called CC. Oh, there we go. CLCW. Okay, I got it. Yeah, here we go. So yeah. Uh, then I suggest uh, we close it uh, out whenever and yeah. go back to Lorenzo okay. for a final All right. check. Yeah, I think. Unless, George, was there anything else you wanted to? I mean, the, the pass already over, so uh, all the other will have to be re rescheduled. Or, uh, no, it's good. It's OK. There was no opportunity for the IPK to complicate. Do you want to, do you want to assemble the image that we downloaded to feel like? Or, or shall yeah. we let Lorenzo do uh, good I'll person? do it, and I'll share it after Lorenzo's talk. 
Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah. All perfect. right. Should I make Lorenzo? Um... Please. Yeah, I have to share my screen. Perfect. You're okay. in. Remind you, we are soon finishing the workshop, but we want to see the picture. <laughs> um, okay. Cool. I'm starting with a much simple demonstration, uh, the camera acquisition system, which provides a full end-to-end -end experiment, which uh, includes uh, a user interface, a ground application, and a space application. Um, uh, with the objective, the objective of the, of the of the system is basically to schedule the activity for taking a photo uh, of a defined ground target uh, from the from the face -tap. The system is constituted by three different applications and demonstrates the communication between the ground and the spacecraft, the the interface with the with the onboard camera, the controlling of the of the spacecraft attitude. And uh, in the end, the prediction of, uh, of the orbital position of the spacecraft. Um, the camera acquisition system is tasked with, uh, with planning and scheduling of photographs, implying a minimal intervention of the user throughout basically a, a high level of automation. The, the, the user is provided with a few crucial in, uh, information needed um, which results basically in, a, in an easy to use system. Uh, the system can be conceptually divided into, uh, sorry for the, give me a second, uh, can be uh, conceptually divided into segments, which uh, in this example will be, will be, will re will be resident on, uh, on space and on ground. The first, uh, um, very simply, is the, the space app, which is resident on board the spacecraft and is responsible for telling the spacecraft when and where to orient uh, in order to, to take the photo. Um, on the ground part, uh, the ground application calculates the time slots of the satellite passes over the target location and fulfills additional constraints. While the, the ground application also prevents multiple, multiple photographs to be, to be scheduled at the same time. And finally, uh, dispatches the photograph commands to the spacecraft and save the progress information received uh, received from the spacecraft. Last but not least, uh, there is the the Django application, which provides the user with the with the web server interface for the correct uh, for the for interfacing the with the with the ground application, which can which can be done by remote, as you can see. And uh, it also displays the ground track uh, of the satellites and provides the tracking information for previous photograph requests. Um, the, the, the operation procedure of the, of the entire system is shown here, and I will, I will quickly, sorry, I will quickly personally. The operation procedure is, uh, starts with the, with the user inserting the desired target information through the web server interface handled by the, by the Django application, uh, which are then transmitted to the ground application. And uh, the ground application then calculates the time slots available for the photo using the current two line elements of the satellite by propagating the orbit either until the end, uh, the enter condition are met or uh, until a, a maximum time slot, which uh, by default is set to a year in the future. Uh, the time slots are then uh, sent back the user on the user interface. And at this point, uh, the user can acknowledge uh, for a specific time slot of the proposed ones. The Django application will send the request uh, back to the, to the app, which is responsible then for communicating the same request to the space application. The space app then uh, starts uh, a countdown from the present time of the request uh, to the to the targeted time, uh, eventually changes the spacecraft pointing mode in order to point uh, to the, 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 the camera to the ground target, and finally takes uh, and saves the onboard photo. And now I will uh, I will click quickly give you a demonstration using the the uh, a simulator. As you can see, um, the the user interface that you have here as first uh, shows the current ground track of the, of the spacecraft. Uh, on the right side here, we, we see there is a set of parameters we can insert. 
These are the latitude of the, of the ground target to be photographed by a spacecraft, the longitude of the, of the ground target, the, the maximum angle of inclination of the line of sight between the spacecraft and the target. And it is also possible to choose a where to take the photo at daytime, at nighttime, or uh, at any time, like in this case we will, we will do. When proceeding with the request of the access information, sorry for, okay. Um, the, the Django application communicates the input, as I said, the, the input parameters we selected to the ground application, and uh, which in turn gives us back uh, a list of accessibility time slots of the spacecraft over the ground target. These time slots uh, are ordered, as you can see, from the, from the closest to, to the latest. We can select one um, from the list. And by selecting one slot and proceeding uh, with the confirmation of the scheduling, the ground app saves the request and assign an identifier to the operation, which can be used to retrieve the operation status. Here is 17. So if we, if we type 17 here, we see that uh, uh, our request is waiting for the uplink because this, this is just a, a demonstration. Uh, but um, after having saved the request, the ground application sends it to the space app, which uh, as a response should have started a timer here, uh, which, yeah, which tells us, as I, as I already said, that the, at, the end, uh, at the end of that timer, the, the satellite will orient to the, to the ground target coordinates and take, uh, and take the photo. Of course, uh, in a in a real operation environment, environment, this uh, this will happen. And this is uh, simply the the end of the presentation. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Okay. Of course, at the end, uh, the the picture is stored by the application, and then you end up with it getting downlinked by the flight control team. Yeah, um, exactly. The, the, the application itself is not responsible for downloading the, and showing to the user the, the photograph, but this is, uh, of course, uh, an open point which uh, can, be, can be added as a feature to the, to the application. Do, do, you still have, do you still have the application at hand? Uh, maybe no. bit... Sorry? I... Ah, yeah, uh, never mind. Yeah, I was wondering if no. you could uh, show maybe a polar region with some of the, uh, yeah, sure. also with a larger... Yeah with a mm -hmm. larger angle uh... as you can see uh, oh. since uh, since the opsat is on is on a polar orbit uh, uh, the the greater is the is the angle uh, is the latitude uh, the the more the more uh, accesses we will have the access will be closest to the to the present time indeed uh, as we can see here is in on the 14th of, of january maybe if we if we go down to to zero to the uh, and we do it again, so no possible with this time slot here, we see that it exactly it, what, what happens is that uh, is that the the accessibility uh, is so low that not even in a in a year time it is. Mm. I don't know how accurate is how accurate is. Uh, All right, Lorenzo, Dominic. George, Dave, Tom. Thank you. Yep. Closing remarks. Yeah, I'll have an image in a, in a minute or so. All right, right. Maybe we can stop it up. But thanks a lot. <laughs> All those details. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we have a lag in time zones, so they collapse, they come one after the other. Right, uh, Otto, yeah, could you share the, this slide?